Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Carrie Jones, and I am the medical director for Precision Analytical. Today, we are going to talk about chronic pain or chronic pain, chronic panic, chronic anxiety, how your stress hormones, your brain, and your endocannabinoid system is just circulating around and around and making it worse. So, we have a lot of systems to cover. Um, and we're going to talk about a lot of sort of treatment to try to help your patients, um, including going over the endocannabinoid system. So the major goal of this whole lecture, which will take about an hour, is so that you as practitioners can tell your patients who come in and say to you, I constantly have panic. I'm chronically um, have anxiety. Every little thing sets me off and I don't know why. So by going through these uh, 60 some slides, you're going to be able to explain to them at least one or two or three reasons why they feel they do. So of course they don't feel crazy. Now they have a why. What is going on in their different systems and then how they can start to regain control again. What you can do as a practitioner to test them, to work with them, to treat them and try to alleviate their panic and alleviate their chronic anxiety. So of course with anxiety, this meme is like the most perfect meme for it, right? What could possibly go wrong? And anxiety says, I'm so glad you asked and immediately sets them into a tailspin. So let's cover some basics. First, we're gonna talk about the endocannabinoid system, which is a super hot topic right now, but with good reason. So for those of you who are new to the endocannabinoid system, um, cannabinoids are your neuromodulators in the body. You have two main ones. One is called anandamide, and the other one, um, we just shorten, call it 2-AG. Now, endocannabinoids or cannabinoids um, that affect the endocannabinoid system affect so many things. I mean, look at that list. Pain, appetite, your motor skills, your stress response, your immune system, fertility, memory, sleep, what have you. And they do so by binding to these two main receptors. You have your CB1 receptor and your CB2 receptor. So your CB1 receptor is primarily central nervous system based. However, you do have CB1 receptors sort of all over. And you can see a lot are in your endocrine system, thyroid, adrenals, testicles, ovaries, but you do have them in your fat cells and you do have them in your intestines. They do affect your GABA and your glutamate release. And this is what we're gonna primarily focus on today, GABA and glutamate, along with some of your other hormones um, like cortisol and norepinephrine. Now your CB1 are activated by anandamide. So this is a good thing, right? The anandamide is, is something we want, especially to help with, with GABA and, um, and even a little bit with, with glutamate. 2-AG can bind to the CB1 receptors. And then of course your plant cannabinoids like THC um, can affect it as well. And for those of you who are maybe just need a little reminder, a little refresher on your neurotransmitters, Glutamate is your main excitatory neurotransmitter. Like we need some for learning, for memory, for alertness. We want some glutamate, but we know when we get too much, that's when we get excitotoxicity and neuronal cell death, which of course we don't want. Now GABA is our main inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's our calming one, right? It makes us feel relaxed, anti-anxiety. That's what GABA does. Um, it is made from glutamate uh, via the glutamate decarboxylase with P5P, which is your vitamin B6 as a cofactor. So if you are missing, if you're low, if you're depleted in B6, then you're gonna have real trouble making your GABA. And we will talk about that later. We're gonna go into things like um, a little bit into like B6 and then other things that help make it like your GAD antibody, the GAD SNP, um, that's uh, the GAD. But little clinical pearl, just because a lot of people say, well, I don't think, I don't know that GABA, the actual supplement works that well, or if the GABA, the supplement does work, um, it, it's not supposed to cross the blood-brain barrier. GABA, the supplement, is supposed to be too big of a, of a molecule to cross. But there's some interesting, very cool research that says that when you take exogenous GABA, then it might actually stimulate your enteric nervous system to tell your central nervous system to make more GABA. And I think that's really pretty cool that there's some communication of, oh, the enteric system tells the central nervous system, make GABA. So by taking supplemental GABA, Yes, there is the thought that maybe it's crossing the blood-brain barrier if you have a leaky, quote unquote, leaky blood-brain barrier. Some people don't think it crosses at all, but this study is saying, you know what, maybe the enteric is telling the central to do it, and that's pretty cool. 
So then we move on to your CB2. So your CB2 receptors primarily are in your peripheral nervous system, but there are small amounts in your central nervous system as well. And lots of CB2 receptors are found in your intestines and in immune system, immune system related uh, tissue and gland. Uh, uh, and cells, you can see there um, like macrophages. And your CB2 is primarily activated by your 2AG. So your CB1 is primarily anandamide and uh, your CB2 is 2AG. And so this lecture, we're gonna focus though on CB1, um, but I wanted to make sure that I covered both. So anandamide is the primary endogenous cannabinoid. We like this, we want this, this is the one we're going for. It does come from arachidonic acids, specifically linoleic oils. So think your safflower, your evening primrose, your grape seed, your sunflower, your hemp seed oil. Um, that's where it comes from. And it's broken down by this thing called fatty acid amide hydrolase, F-A-A-H. And this comes into play later. So if you don't have a lot of anandamide, it's possible your fatty acid amide hydrolase has gone up and we will talk about what to do about that. So then people say, all right, well, how does CBD, the supplement, help me? Well, CBD, the supplement, doesn't actually directly stimulate your CB1 or your CB2 receptors. It does help THC, so if you're taking a combination, THC, CBD, um, it helps THC bind to receptors. Um, CBD does stimulate other receptors, your vanilloid, your adenosine, serotonin receptors, and CBD inhibits that FAAH enzyme, so if you, you don't break down your anandamide, which is a good thing. So the more CBD you have or take um, in your system, then the more anandamide you will likely have in circulation. But we're gonna talk about that later as well. So we've got the endocannabinoid system covered. We're gonna focus on CB1. We're gonna focus on um, increasing anandamide and why. And we're gonna focus on um, how you can stop the breakdown of FAAH. But now we have to go into the HPA axis because it's greatly tied into your endocannabinoid system and people don't realize this. So with your HPA axis, it's all about allostasis, right? Maintaining stability through chains because you're trying to ensure survival through extreme situations. And your primary mediators are of course your catecholamines, your cortisol, your DHEA, and your cytokines. And of course, your inflammatory cytokines play a huge role here. And you can see in this quote, these are this is what we know, it's what we all um, preach and, and, and talk about as functional practitioners, Multiple components of an unhealthy lifestyle, including overnutrition, poor sleep, toxic chemicals, are also able to contribute to the phenotype of allostasis, meaning it can greatly disrupt it, right? It can greatly screw it up, throw it off, and now the body is scrambling to get back there. But allostasis is, is kind of, you know, really what the body is going for. But it's, these, it's catecholamines and cortisol that we're going to focus on. So as a little reminder, when it comes to the HPA access, with the ship is sinking in your life or you're running from a tiger in your life, then your homeostasis or your allostasis is actually threatened or perceived to be so. It's emotional based, of course, physical based, psychological based, environmental chemical stressors. But please remember that stress is actual, anticipated or imagined. It doesn't matter. Your HPA access reacts the exact same way. So if you are actually having stress, if you're actually exposed to some Thing, if you actually ate something you shouldn't have, then your HP axis kicks off. But if you're the type of person or the patient is who is talking to you is the type of person that is anticipatory, they're a worst case scenario type of person, they imagine the worst case scenario type of person, they make mountains out of molehills, then you're going to get the exact same reaction in the HPA axis. So our anticipated and our imagined react the exact same the cascade happens as if there's an actual stress happened. So this is really important for those chronic panic, chronic anxiety people, because they sort of get stuck in this anticipated imagined stress and it's cumulative over time. And we're gonna get there, but we're gonna talk about how this affects the amygdala in your brain and how that's a big one causing a lot of these symptoms. So the problem is you get this stress response and instead of going to your neocortex for logical processing, right? Instead, you get complete freak out because the hypothalamus goes to the pituitary, goes to the adrenals and you release 
cortisol, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. And we know this in, in our life because how many of you have had a stressful event happen that maybe wasn't so stressful or maybe thinking back on it, you're like, man, why did I freak out? That wasn't, that wasn't really as stressful as, as it should have been or as I thought it was going to be. And it's because the body doesn't go to the neocortex for logical processing, which in the, in the grand scheme of survival is a good thing, right? We, if, if a stressful situation is happening, um, you know, like if we're literally running from the tiger, if the ship is literally sinking, then we don't want to stop and overprocess it, which is what many of us will do. The neocortex will start to um, logically think our way through it or overthink our way through it. And, and it's too late, like the tiger has eaten us because we've decided to stop and think about it too much. So on the one hand, it's good. But on the other hand, we get this chronic freak out that can happen. And so if you just need a little reminder on the fight or flight response, you get the initiation of the response. Basically what happens is everything, all the sensory nerves comes up to your brain. Your hypothalamus makes the call and it sends out CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone or releasing factor, depending on um, where you live in the world and what you're reading. Um, and then that tells the pituitary gland to release ACTH into the bloodstream. The adrenals make cortisol. It takes about 10 minutes-ish to make cortisol. So cortisol is not the immediate thing that gets released. What gets released immediately is your norepinephrine and epinephrine. That's dumped immediately because norepi and epi are stored um, in vesicles. And as soon as they get this signal, they're just like, Psh, I'm out, like out in the system. And that's what helps. And the follow-up is cortisol um, several minutes later. So the simplified stress response is this. Everything, all the arrows, all the red arrows coming right up to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus makes CRH. Um, the anterior pituitary makes ACTH. And you get norepinephrine and epinephrine uh, right away. And you get cortisol several minutes later. Now, when it comes to norepinephrine and epinephrine, this is one of my absolute most favorite quotes in all of research. So chronic stress, if continued for a long time, can damage many parts of the body. A significant part of the damage is due to the effects of sustained norepinephrine release because of norepinephrine's general function of directing resources away from maintenance, regeneration, reproduction, and towards systems that are required for active movement. Y'all, how many of your patients can't maintain, can't regenerate, and have problems with reproduction? All of them, right? Like all of them do. And how many of them have a significant amount of stress going on? all of them. And you can see as you keep reading the quote, the consequences include sleeplessness, loss of libido, GI problems, impaired disease resistance, lower rate of injury healing, depression, increased vulnerability to addiction. So norepinephrine is no joke. We have to take it seriously. So how does all of this, how does, how does, how does the endocannabinoid system, how does, you know, this talk about the HPA axis, how does chronic panic and chronic anxiety come into play with all of this? So as a little reminder, I was looking up the definitions of both panic and anxiety because I just wanted to see, like, you know, is if, if we taken a word and, you know, sort of use it beyond something that it was actually originally defined. And it turns out panic is a sudden overwhelming fear with or without cause that produces hysterical or irrational behavior and often spreads quickly through a group of persons or animals. So fear, overwhelming fear is the big thing. Now, anxiety is interesting. Distress or uneasiness of mind caused by fear of danger or misfortune. So fear, again, is sort of the big underlying um, emotion that people get with anxiety and panic. And who has anxiety? Turns out lots of people have anxiety. In fact, the National Institutes of Mental Health states that about 19% of United States adults and 31% of those between the 18, ages of 13 and 18 years old have reported an anxiety disorder. Imagine the amount of people who have not reported or formally sort of been diagnosed, but if you were to ask them, do you get anxious? Is, is it anxiety common for you? Um, that they would say yes. So 19% of adults, 31% of you know um, teenagers say that they, they've been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. In 2012, um, they did a study that looked at 87 studies across 44 countries and found 80 anxiety effects 0.9%, which is hilarious, up to 28.3% of people. And they found the major factors were gender, age, culture, conflict, and economic status. And of course, in this day and age, all of those things are, um, you know, kind of under attack. And as a result, anxiety is a big thing for people of the world. 
And because anxiety is a big thing for people of the world, the World Health Organization, Harvard, University of Michigan, and other country-based researchers are um, collectively looking at data across 27 countries because anxiety disorder is so common. So anxiety in our world across the globe is on the rise. It's on the increase. And common but not all inclusive causes of anxiety are huge. And I included this list because I think people forget that even something such as medication side effects can cause anxiety. For example, if you're on um, a medication that increases norepinephrine um, if, or, or, even, or epinephrine, um, if you're on a medication you know, that's very stimulatory, then you know, anxiety might be a big problem for you. And even supplements. I mean, think about it. How many of your patients have taken DHE? or tyrosine and called and said that anxiety is a problem. What about other stuff? Lack of oxygen can stimulate anxiety. How many of your patients are iron deficient anemic or even, you know, subclinical low iron? They can't get that circulating oxygen. They don't feel like they can take, you know, decent full breaths. And as a result, it might trigger anxiety in them. Of course, we have genetic reasons, which we will talk about, hormonal imbalances. I mean, there's a huge list when it comes to what causes anxiety. So it will take possibly a little bit of digging on your end, but we're gonna to try to tie all these systems together. So going back, remember that stress is actual, it's anticipated, or it's imagined. The reaction is the exact same in your brain. It doesn't matter. And the reason is, is primarily because of the amygdala. So your amygdala is located in the temporal lobes at the end of the hippocampus, and it has a huge, huge influence on your HPA axis and your gut brain, which of course is your, is your vagus nerve, your, you know, your vagal tone. It's your amygdala that you're, you need to like really work on and try to appease. If you have a lot of stressors early in life, um, then you get this increased sensitivity to stress as an adult. So working with kids, working with teens right away, getting them healthy right away will really go a long way way and helping making them better adults, less stressful adults, less anxious adults, because they show that the more stress that somebody has early in life, then they get this increased sensitivity as an adult. And I'll tell you why. So the amygdala, though, is responsible for fear. That's what it does. So it does other stuff. You can see the list. But the amygdala is your fear-based um, memory processing. So PTSD, on one end and just sort of your normal everyday fear anxiety on the other end. That's what the amygdala does. And it's important. If you don't feel fearful and you're in the forest and you see this ghostly being pop up and you don't decide you're gonna run away, like that's probably a problem. But what you need is to walk in the forest and have your amygdala turn on and freak out when this ghostly being pops up so that you turn, don't think about it, you don't go to your neocortex for logical processing, you turn and run away and protect yourself. But here's the problem, the more stimulation your amygdala receives, the more anxiety, the more PTSD, fear and aggression a person might experience on the day to day. So the more priming your amygdala gets, the more anxious, more fear, more aggression, what have you. And it's gotten out of hand, right? Nowadays in our society, it's, it's, I mean, it was stressful for me to put the slide together. Looking at all these pictures, like my heart rate went up. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, don't, I, I feel anxious just looking at this slide right here because it's just all the pictures of ways in which anxiety affects our, affects our body. When anxiety and fear responses are disproportional in intensity, are chronic, are irreversible, and not associated with any actual risk, it impairs physical and psychological functions. And we know that. We have patients, we have family members, we ourselves who get anxiety know that it can greatly impair our physical and our psychological function. I mean, it can be paralyzing, right? People can have such severe anxiety and fear, be very fear-based, that it paralyzes anything they do, either physically or decision makings in their job, in their relationship, it doesn't matter. So let's tie the whole thing together so that we can focus on things like treatment. Okay, you have a lot of CB1 receptors in your amygdala. Surprise, right? Endocannabinoid, you have a lot of endocannabinoid CB1 receptors in your amygdala. It's calming. The, you know, amygdala is fear, 
CB1 is calming. Anandamide binds to CB1 receptors and inhibits glutamate release, which is good. In the HPA axis, when there's a stress response of any kind, your CRH is released from the hypothalamus. And unfortunately, CRH increases that FAAH. And when you have higher levels of that, you break down your anandamide. Now you have less. So higher stress response, higher CRH, lower anandamide, because it gets broken down faster. And when you have lower anandamide levels, you have higher glutamate and your amygdala freaks out. Your fear goes up. Higher glutamate, brain on fire, right? Neuronal cell death is the problem. Learning and memory is one thing. Brain on fire, neuronal cell death is an entirely different thing. We don't want this. So why does glutamate get out of control? It's excitotoxicity. And it happens in this cycle, this glutamine glutamate cycle that goes round and round between your neurons and your astroglial cells. And so people will say, oh my gosh, it comes from glutamine. I give my patient glutamine supplementation for their gut. I don't want to give them glutamine supplementation because it's going to, you know, worsen the cycle. But lucky for you, the glutamate glutamine cycle is pretty tightly controlled and about 85% of the glutamate is pushed to glutamine. Now remember, we need some glutamate. It's just when it gets stuck that it's the problem. So when it when it's stuck, then you get the neuronal cell death. So why, why might it get stuck? Well, one of the big reasons is you have this problem going from pyruvate to oxaloacetate, OAA. And this gunks up the works. It sort of stops the cycle from going round and round. And it requires glucose. So regular eating is really important. So if you have those anxious, panic people, and they say, like, it, it gets worse if I skip meals, or I get hangry when I skip meals, or I start to like get short of breath when I'm really hungry, and I, you know, I get sort, you know, I get revved up or, or um, panicky, or you know, can't breathe if I skip meals. Um, then it, this is partly reason why. Um, depletion in biotin. If you don't have enough biotin, biotin is required. If you have mitochondrial issues, ATP, NAD, and you need pyruvate carboxylase to get it going. Plus, you need your Krebs cycle working. But think about blood sugar. Think about how many of your patients have blood sugar issues, either hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic, can, can affect this recycling. So then I get asked, okay, well, if I have a lot of glutamate issues, doesn't that mean my GABA should be higher? Because glutamate makes GABA. It's like, well, unfortunately, not necessarily. One, it's very tightly controlled. Two, if the person is B6 deficient, which is really common, then you're going to have a hard time making GABA. And if they have the glutamic acid decarboxylase antibody or the mutation, then their GABA will be lower. And for those of you who aren't quite familiar with the um, glutamic acid decarboxylase antibody, the GAT antibody, it's really often pretty common in autoimmune disease. So you can see there type 1 uh, diabetes, um, type 2 diabetes, there's stiff person syndrome, those with Hashimoto's, so they're anti-TPO patients positive. Um, and in that study, they also found as their uh, anti-TPO values went up, so do their GAD anti-GAD anti numbers, which means oftentimes their anxiety increased and they had issues with their pancreas, right? Their insulin, because um, not only does GAD help make GABA, but it's it's really important in the pancreas as well. And there is a link between gluten sensitivity and those who are positive for the anti-GAD antibody. So it's actually much more common than we think, and especially as, as autoimmune is on the rise, um, we have to be aware of this antibody. Now, what about the GAD gene mutation? So the antibody is one thing, and then we have the actual, the SNP, and you get a mutation. And you can see on the bottom there, I have it circled in red, the brain is the highest concentration for the GAD gene mutation. So think again, and more prone to anxiety, more prone to panic. And then the pancreas, again, that's that type one diabetes picture, or maybe type 1.5, sort of that autoimmune picture. And then look to the far right, you'll see that um, the testes, the poor testes, do the testicles get anxious? Well, it turns out it's not actually well studied. So GABA might help with testosterone production, they think, and it might help with sperm formation, but they're not entirely sure, but they do know that GABA is produced in the testicles themselves. And if you have GAD gene mutation, you're gonna have problems making GABA in the testicles um, and it can result in hormonal or sperm formation issues. How interesting is that? Apparently the ovaries do not get anxious. They, they're good. They, they have their own issues, right? They have other stuff going on. The GAD gene mutation is not quite their thing, but the brain, it's all about the brain with this.
Which lastly leads us to norepinephrine, because we can't talk about things like cortisol and fear and amygdala without talking about norepinephrine or noradrenaline. So norepinephrine increases the number of evoked action potentials and long-term potentiation, which increases plasticity. What does that fancy sentence mean? It means that the amygdala is quicker to respond to the same stimulus. So when you get gut issues, when you have a busy, stressful, scheduled, overly scheduled day, when you're fighting with your significant other, your friends, your family, your coworkers, when you have stealth infections or overt infections that you're working on, when you are just at your wit's end, when you have a lot of financial debt, when you're not sleeping, when you're up too late on your phone, um, then all of this results in patients say to you, I didn't used to respond this way to whatever the stressor is, and now it's like I get stressed or anxious, fearful very quickly. How many of your patients say this to you? How many of your patients say, five years ago, I could handle this, and now I can't handle it, or 10 years ago, or six months ago, or sometimes it's last week. Last week, I could handle this, and this week, I cannot. I'm ready to snap. My, ang my anxiety is high, my stress is high, my, I'm very fear-based. I don't know what's going on. And it's because plasticity. So your norepinephrine is constantly pinging on your amygdala. Your cortisol is constantly um, pinging on your amygdala. Your, your stress response is lowering your anandamide. And so the brain is taking the path of least resistance, which is go to fear, go to anxiety, go to panic. And so instead of taking a different route, like a more optimistic, happy route, it goes down sort of the dark hole route. And plasticity, of course, is changeable. It's malleable. You can get off this pathway. It just takes time because this is the path of least resistance. But this is how, because all these hormones involved are constantly pinging the amygdala and you're missing out on anandamide and you just keep ma making this path, this, this little grooved out bike path here, deeper and deeper and deeper in your amygdala and your fear releases. Then speaking of SNPs, how does your norepinephrine get broken down? This is just as more of a general reminder for you. Norepinephrine and epinephrine are broken down by COMPT, C-O-M-T, and M-A-O or MAO. And if you can't, if you have a slow COMPT or a slow M-A-O, then you're going to have a tough time breaking your norepinephrine down, which means you're going to have norepinephrine spinning around in your body longer because it can't get broken down. And so my um, one of my uh, very best friends, has um, both COMPT and MAO in her genes. And what's so interesting is in medical school, she used to say to me, I get stressed out and it lasts all day. I can't calm down. I'm short of breath. I feel anxious. My heart rate is fast. And I don't understand. The stress is over and I'm not over it. And then once we did SNP testing on her many, many years later and saw that she has slow COMPT and slow MAO, we were like, oh, it's no wonder, whereas my COMPT and MAO are um, not slow. And so when I get stressed out, it, it happens. And then, like you know, minutes later, I'm over it. Hers takes hours, hours to get over. So if you have a slow COMPT and slow MAO, and this sounds like you, you get stressed out or anxious, and it takes you hours to calm down, this is why. So what do you do about it? What do you do about it, right? Like, this is a lot. We have covered so we've covered multiple hormones, we've covered multiple systems, we've talked about the amygdala, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is a lot. Where do, where do, how do we treat this? The good thing is there is a lot you can do. There's a lot you can help these patients. Now, conventional medicine says, right here, take this pill. So they give them benzodiazepines, they put them on Xanax, they put them on, you know, Valium, and and they put them on SSRIs or other antidepressant medication. Sometimes they put them on beta blockers because, of course, if you can get your heart rate to slow down, then it can um, oftentimes not trigger an anxiety attack. Um, and sometimes beta blockers are every day, uh, of course, and sometimes they're situational. So people who fly, people who speak, people um, who are, you know, up in public and when they get nervous, their heart rate goes up and that triggers anxiety for them. Um, and then, of course, going to counseling, which I am all in favor of counseling in its various forms. but Beyond benzodiazepines, SSRIs, and beta blockers, what can you do? So first and foremost, I'm going to just assume that you guys are amazing, super fabulous functional medicine practitioners, and you are addressing the cause. So if you know that they have nutrient deficiencies, if you know that they're on medications, if you you know know what's triggering their stress, you know if you're you're working on you know 
dietary habits, lifestyle habits, chemical exposures, what have you. Like y'all have that covered. I'm just I'm just going to assume that. What I'm going to cover more is like you've worked past that and they're still anxious. They're still have a lot of fear and panic. So addressing the HPA, addressing the endocannabinoid system, the gut, looking at the SNPs, um, looking at things like P5P or vitamin B6, serotonin, GABA, and then that glutamate, glutamine cycle as you go down. But if you address the first four, so obviously the cause, because that's what we do, the HPA access, the endocannabinoid system and the gut, like you are going to address the majority of fear and anxiety and panic. So first and foremost, though, like you kind of have to see where your patient's at. So it's best to test the HPA axis, get a detailed understanding of their cortisol and cortisone, because remember, cortisone is inactive. Cortisol is active. And of course, doing uh, Dutch testing for that. You can also consider norepinephrine testing. You can you can test norepinephrine itself um, through um, uh, neurotransmitter testing, or some a lot of people like to do the organic acid, which is the vanil mandalate, uh, such as is in the Dutch test, and focusing on stress reduction, lifestyle choices such as you know meditation, journaling, yoga, self care, get the blood sugar under control. Why would I say get the blood sugar under control when it comes to the HPA axis? It's because it's cortisol's primary job. Now remember, cortisol is a glucocorticosteroid, and it's called that for a reason. Gluco because glucose is its primary job. Corticose because it's a you know made in the cortex, and steroid because it's a steroid hormone. So if you don't ever get your patient's blood sugar under control, you will never address, fix, heal, help their HPA axis because it's constantly going to be reacting, counter-reacting, bouncing around to address um, to address all that blood sugar, all the blood sugar issues, either lack of or too much. So definitely get your patient's blood sugar under control. Get their sleep dialed in. So how many of you were on your phones last night before bed? How many of you are watching this and it's dark outside, um, but you're on your phone or computer but on a bright screen? So definitely go to bed at a decent hour. Aim for seven to nine hours of sleep. Remember, it's that deep sleep that where all the repair, maintenance, rejuvenation happens. It's not your REM sleep. It's your deep sleep. In your deep sleep, that's when all your, your brain cells shrink a little bit and it allows your glymphatic system to turn on. And your glymphatic system is what clears out all the junk and the toxins and the debris, but it also helps circulate nutrients. Your glymphatic system... And that's glymphatic with a G as opposed to lymphatic with an L. So glymphatic is turned off by norepinephrine. So the higher amounts of norepinephrine you have, likely the less deep sleep you'll have and the less repair and the less activity in your glymphatic system you'll have. So get your, get your sleep dialed in and get your norepinephrine down. So winding down at night, avoiding electronics for a solid hour or more before bed. Um, consider blue light blocking glasses for sure. They're those um, amber color glasses. And if you have, uh, I apologize, I only know how to do it on the iPhone. I'm assuming the Android, Android could probably do it too. But you can just Google, how do you change the background screen of your phone? And on an iPhone, I have it set as a, um, um, as a quick, is a is a quick key, and so I just you know tap my home screen or, or home button three times, and the background of my iPhone um, becomes amber, or actually it becomes quite red, and then I can change it back to normal color at night. This is different than you can set the setting of your phone to be dimmer. You know, there's like night mode where you can set it to be a lot less bright. Mine is less bright and red um, at night. I have I have that set for at night, so you can do that too. And I know that there are apps that you can install that will help um, for your, your phone and your computer as well. Um, but th that's just what I do. Now, what does Dutch test? So those of you who are familiar with us, this is going to look very, very familiar. And if you're brand new, you can see when it comes to adrenal support, um, adrenal testing, uh, we do quite a bit. So we do melatonin, DHEAS, and the metabolites metabolize cortisol. We do look at your um, tetrahydra um, cortisol versus your tetrahydra cortisone, uh, your THE, THF, which is a, an indirect or sort of pseudo direct um, uh, ability to look at how your enzyme 11 beta HSD is doing. And 11 beta HSD is the enzyme uh, found in tissues that either activates your cortisol on or deactivates it off to cortisone. 
So this is helpful to know in your tissues, like what does your body prefer? Do you prefer to be on or off? We look at free cortisol and the free cortisol pattern. We look at free cortisone and the free cortisone pattern. Again, this is helpful because sometimes you get a free cortisol that's quite low. And it turns out it's not that you can't make it. It's because you're deactivating all of it, which is which is a different treatment plan. So knowing cortisol and cortisone can help you differentiate. Can I make it? And how much is getting deactivated? We do look at HVA, homovanillate, which is a dopamine metabolite. We look at VMA, uh, vanilla mandalate, which is a norepinephrine epinephrine metabolite. And you have the option not shown in this picture for the cortisol awakening response, um, which is the, um, the response. First thing in the morning, of course, it's, it's testing um, on waking 30 minutes later and 30 minutes after that, because you want to see that quick cortisol rise um, within, within an hour to an hour and a half. It should go up and then start to come down. That's the cortisol awakening response. It's viewed as the mini sort of stress test of your day. If you can't get that right, then you're not going to get much else right, like stress response, like inflammatory response, like blood sugar response, autoimmune correction. Um, your cortisol awakening response does a lot. Uh, so we can we can add that on. But how do you su how do you support the HPA axis? Well, unfortunately, because of time, I don't have a whole lot to go of time to go into that. But it's what you think. It's the, it's your adaptogens. It's your ashwagandha, your rhodiola, luthercoccus, panax, quincopholium your ginseng, your pantothenic acid, your vitamin C, et cetera. And then if you have someone with truly, really elevated cortisol, um, you can use a lot of the calming stuff. So holy basil is one of my absolute favorites. I do holy basil tea pretty much every night before bed. Uh, phosphatidylserine, another huge favorite of mine. Avena, which is milky oats. L-theanine, which I will talk about in a little bit. Lavender, passion flower, magnolia. Now, magnolia is a really cool one. Magnolia has hinochials in it. And hinochials help convert that 11 beta HSD away from cortisol into cortisone. So if you have someone that makes a lot of cortisol, especially at night, they're very cortisol dominant at night. Everything's turned on towards cortisol. Magnolia done at night, that, that hinochial can actually, can, can, temporarily push towards cortisone so that they can fall asleep and stay asleep um, while you're working on all the sort of stress relax before bed sleep hygiene type stuff. How do you address the endocannabinoid system? Well, your primary goals are to lower CRH from the hypothalamus. Why? Because that increases FAAH and that lowers anandamide. So if you address the HPA axis right off the bat, you are addressing the endocannabinoid system. You are helping to make more anandamide. But to when you raise anandamide, you will lower glutamate. So how do you also help? Well, you can use supplementation with CBD, cannabidiol, which is one of the many um, uh, cannabinoids in cannabis. It does not have the THC effect. So it is not the mind altering effect that you get with uh, THC. And CBD inhibits FAAH, which is great because CRH from, the, from your hypothalamus makes this um, increase, but CBD, taking CBD makes it decrease, and now you have a lot more anandamide able to be float around. And CBD is being researched like crazy. You guys, it's like the, right? It's like the new, it's like the new curcumin. It's like the new turmeric CBD. But with, when it comes to anxiety and panic, I mean, I've just listed just a handful of, of, um, uh, uh, PMCID numbers there, but there, I mean, there's so many, there's, there's, there's tons. If you PubMed search, you'll find a, a million um, all about it. Dosing and route of administration, of course, varies. You can take it, you know, orally as a capsule, you can take it as a tincture, you can use it topically as a cream. Um, and the typical range, the five to 50 milligrams is definitely more, um, you know, oral sublingual uh, tincture type. Um, but please remember quality counts because of the explosion of CBD um, and the popularity of CBD. There are a lot of companies that have, are jumping on the bandwagon, but they're not, they've never done this before. So make sure that you, the company that you choose, um, and I have no affiliation, I'm just, I'm just, you know, reminding you, make sure the company that you choose um, gets, has their CBD. It's free of heavy metals. It's free from mold, mildew, fungus bacteria and, and other harmful chemicals. Cause of course it, you know, it comes from hemp and it's grown and you want to make sure that you've got good quality, you know, farmers and good quality plants and subsequently good quality processes to make the CBD. So five to 50 milligrams is your typical dose. And if you've never done anything, you know, in the cannabis world before in the hemp world, start small, start at the five, 10 milligram and, and see how you do. And then, and then go up from there. 
Focusing on the gut. Focusing on the gut is a huge one. So the amygdala receives communication from the gut. So the amygdala, right, fear base, receives tons of info from the gut going through the vagal complex. So there's that vagus nerve. And the amygdala does control the autonomic nervous system and can affect your parasympathetic and your sympathetic branches, different, different nerves in, in there. And so it's really important that you address the gut because that will counter and help calm down the amygdala. And we know that stress, of course, increases sympathetic and decreases parasympathetic. And stress increases um, all sorts of stuff like intestinal permeability and inflammation and you know, indigestion and, and can just affects the microbiome. And then, you know, food intolerances and allergies, what you're eating, if you're eating things you shouldn't be eating, that'll increase inflammation in and around the gut. And then, of course, if your gut is not good and you don't have very good um, enzymes or hydrochloric acid, now you can't break down your foods and you get these amino acid sequences that are getting through and they're getting attacked by the immune system and results in molecular mimicry and possibly the increase of autoimmune. So you want to break down your foods, you want to break down these amino acid sequences into single amino acids, that's what's absorbed and, and appreciated. It's the sequences that are the problem and that trigger the immune system. So make sure you, you know, your enzymes are good, your, your hydrochloric acid is good, you're chewing, chew your food, hello, chew your food, um, and that will help significantly. But if you address the gut, like I said, the amygdala calms down, so you have less fear and anxiety. Your HPA axis will calm down, so you will have less CRH from the hypothalamus, which means you have more anandamide. You will have less cortisol, less norepinephrine, um, which means you have less stress and less anxiety. And your immune system will calm down. And if your immune system's calm down, then you have less inflammation, cytokines, stress, and anxiety. So you see how this all, I mean, we always say it all the time, right? It, it, everything everything starts in the gut. And it's true because the amygdala has such a huge impact um, on the gut that if your gut is a mess, then it's only going to make your anxiety and panic that much worse. So what about GAD and GABA? Well, you can test for it if you want to. So consider GAD antibody testing. It's That's a blood test. You can do GAD genetic testing. So for those of you who are, who are doing SNP testing, then you know it's a saliva or a cheek swab, depending on the company that you use. Um, you consider testing for and or you know adding in P5P, which is vitamin B6. And one of the indirect ways that you can test is through a marker called xanthurinate, which is an organic acid vitamin B6 marker that is found on the Dutch test. So if this marker is high, um, it actually means that B6 is likely low in the body. You can support GABA. So can, how do you support GABA? Well, you can give GABA. Typical dose there, 500 to 1,000 milligrams. And if you go back to that study I showed way at the beginning, it's possible um, that GABA taking as a supplement will help stimulate the, um, you know, the enteric nervous system, will help stimulate the autonomic nervous system, or the autonomic, not the autonomic, the central nervous system to make GABA. You can consider phenibut. Be very, very careful with phenibut. While it does work, you have to cycle it. Um, don't stay on it forever, absolutely. Um, and then oral progesterone and pregnenolone. So how, and, and, even, and actually even sublingual, oral or sublingual progesterone and pregnenolone. Um, and the reason sublingual can work is that most people end up swallowing some of it anyway. When progesterone and pregnenolone go through first pass, they explode into a lot of metabolites. So they can become beta, pregnenodiol, or alpha, pregnenodiol. And alpha, pregnenodiol, turns into aloe, A-L-L-O, not, not aloe the plant, but A-L-L-O, and aloe crosses the blood-brain barrier and um, supports GABA, GABA-A receptors. And so when you have women that take, uh, and men too who take pregnenolone, but when you have women who do oral or sublingual progesterone and men or women who do uh, oral or sublingual pregnenolone, and they say, gosh, my anxiety is so much better, I'm more relaxed, I'm sleeping better, it's because of that GABA A, that GABA A. You don't get that kind of support with um, the topical. Now, progesterone imbalance can help with anxiety in general, but that's why the oral and sublingual work so well. And the great thing about the Dutch test is that we do look at your alpha pregnenodiol levels to tell you, are you an alpha dominant person or a beta dominant person? So this is really great for those women heading into menopause and they say, um, hello, my hormones are changing and my anxiety is worse. And I can look and say, oh gosh, your alpha pregnandiol is quite low, 
or you're a beta person, you, you, don't, you don't favor the alpha, and that's, that's likely a big reason why. You can consider L-theanine. Well, L-theanine um, doesn't bind necessarily to the GABA receptors. It blocks glutamate receptors, um, and therefore it helps quite a bit uh, with you being anti-excitatory, which is less anxiety, and increases alpha brain waves. So you get increased relaxation, um, yet alertness. And the great thing about theanine is that it kicks in pretty quickly. It kicks in about a half an hour and um, lasts a couple of hours. And so people often will do L-theanine on the fly. So if they um, are having a bad day at work, if they're, they're about to do something very stressful, if they literally on the fly have to get on an airplane and it stresses them out, they can take L-theanine beforehand and then it, you know, it kicks in. It's kind of like ibuprofen. Uh, it kicks in about 30 minutes, lasts a couple hours. That's what it's good for. And then you can strongly consider a gluten-free diet because I showed you um, earlier that there's some research between gluten-free and um, your uh, GAD. So we've got to be careful there. Serotonin support. Um, we know that serotonin is quite associated with, you know, depression. Of course, that's why people are given SSRIs. Remember, though, that it is primarily made in the gut. Only a very small percentage is made in the brain. It does come from tryptophan, so make sure that your patient is eating protein, um, enough protein to get tryptophan. But be aware that tryptophan can go, go two different directions. Tryptophan can become serotonin, which is, you know, the point. But primarily, tryptophan can become kynurinine, or you'll see KYN. That's, that's a pathway that makes NAD. And while a lot goes to kynurinine, um, we, if you can, you can push this pathway higher. So if you are estrogen dominant, if you have high levels of estrogen and high cortisol or high norepinephrine, you will reduce your serotonin production and you will push tryptophan to kynurinine. So definitely test, do, do on the Dutch test, evaluate the nine estrogen markers and, and look at the HPA function, look at the, um, the VMA marker for norepinephrine and epinephrine and see if those things are all, you know, dominant, high, and they have a lot of depression and even anxiety, it's possible that they are lowering their serotonin production. And on top of that, low serotonin, or excuse me, low estrogen reduces serotonin production. So it's, you know, like, especially for women, like we just can't win with estrogen. High estrogen pushes us away from serotonin and low estrogen means we can't make serotonin. So when you go from tryptophan to 5-HTP, estrogen binds to the estrogen receptor and big serotonergic areas of your brain. And that helps make um, your tryptophan hydroxylase, which is the rate limiting step. Well, if you don't have a lot of estrogen, let's say you're menopausal, um, and this commonly happens, or, or maybe you're postpartum. Think of like postpartum depression. You deliver the baby, your estrogen goes really low, and as a result, you have depression. So you miss out on that tryptophan to 5-HTP step that the estrogen can't catalyze that. And so in that case, um, for people, I'm like, well, forget tryptophan, just take 5-HTP, just bypass that step altogether. Um, it because high estrogen, low estrogen, you can't win. It's unfortunate, but there's a lot you can do for estrogen. That's just an entirely different webinar. Cofactors for making serotonin, of course, biopterin, P5P again, so vitamin B6, and serotonin um, is broken down by MAO, so doing considering SNP testing. Supplements, of course, 5-HTP. People will, like I said, people ask me, can I just give tryptophan? You can, of course, um, I'm all about protein for sure, but if you give tryptophan, you can't guarantee it will go to serotonin. It might go towards kynurinine and the production of NAD, which you might need, but you may also need serotonin. So consider 5-HTP instead. Um, COMPT. So again, those of you getting into SNP testing and genomics, COMPT and MAO, so you can do testing for that. And like I said earlier, if you have slow clearance, then your norepinephrine and epinephrine will circulate around longer. And we know that is just going to ping on your amygdala and make fear-based anxiety that much worse. So when you do HVA and VMA on Dutch testing, um, or really any organic acid testing for that matter, these levels will be lower to historically because COMP and MAO are slow. So like nothing's coming through, right? So HVA and VMA are lower. So what I don't want people to think is, oh, like VMA is norepinephrine and epinephrine, metabolite. Oh, VMA is low. They must not have a lot of norepinephrine. When in fact, it might be a fake out. It might be low comp, slow comp. So they have low VMA, but actually they have really high norepinephrine levels. This is why symptoms are so important. They're really anxious and nervous and panicky. 
with a slow comp or slow MAO or slow both, um, then you probably don't want to give them or address or raise uh, anything in the adrenal system. You want balance and nourishing. Comps cofactors, magnesium and SAMe are the two cofactors. How many of your patients are magnesium depletion are depleted? All of them, probably, much like B6. Um, and then SAMe, which is the other big is the big methyl donor for COMPT. Of course, you have to have the entire methionine cycle working. That's your homocysteine to methionine and back around again. So think of methyl, right? Methyl B5, me or uh, methyl B5. Well, that <laughs> methyl B12 is what I meant to say. Your methyl B12, your methylfolate, anything make methyl is helpful. Try methylglycine, methionine, uh, choline. That helps that whole system go round and round. And for MAO, you actually need vitamin B2 or riboflavin. That's the big cofactor there. And again, chronic stress and inflammation slows down MAO. So if you already have a patient who's chronically stressed, you know they have inflammation, infection especially, some of those stealth infections, mold, Lyme, viruses, you know, address those. Definitely like get right on top of those because that will help the MAO um, enzyme work better. And check their glutathione levels. So in Dutch testing, it's um, we do look at pyroglutamate, which is the organic acid for glutathione. Addressing the glutamate and glutamine cycle. Well, you're trying to make that OAA work better. You're trying to get that system to move so glutamate doesn't get trapped and then cause neuronal cell death. So like I said earlier, as you are being the super fabulous functional medicine practitioner that you are, you're working with your person on blood sugar. So definitely working with them on any hypo or hyperglycemic issues while you're also working on their HPA axis, because sometimes people are really depleted. Their, their, um, their production of cortisol, um, their ability to make cortisol, the signal from the brain to make cortisol is not that great. And, and then they get these hypoglycemic sort of episodes because cortisol can't uh, uh, trigger uh, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. So focus on dietary habits, blood sugar, and focus on HPA to help the system. Consider biotin um, as a supplement or, you know, test for biotin deficiency and address any mitochondrial health issues, um, any uh, ATP and uh, um, ATP health, uh, mitochondrial health to make ATP and um, NAD. So what are your big take home messages? Because we have covered a million things, but I wanted to give you lots of options because anxiety and panic and fear are huge and it's on the rise and I and I know that you know some of you have tried some of these things like well yeah I tried GABA or I tried theanine it didn't work like okay let's give you a whole other option let's give you a huge you know bigger um, toolbox that you can pull from to try to help these patients to try to help the amygdala calm down try to help the anandamide go up try to help the CRH from the hypothalamus go down Try to help cortisol balance, try to help norepinephrine go down, you know, all these things to really address their anxiety and panic. So number one, your endocannabinoid system plays a role in keeping you calm and reducing your anxiety. It does this through anandamide. Your stress system, your HPA axis, is required when you really need fight or flight. Like, you need it. Don't vilify cortisol. When you need it, you need it. But too much or too long, and now you break down anandamide and you get more anxiety. So in your brain, your amygdala deals with fear. So it has like the picture of the, the, the ghostly ghouly person who jumps up from the forest in the middle of the night. If you see that, you want your amygdala to tell you to run. But too much stress, not enough anandamide means you react and respond quicker. So now you have more stress, more panic, more anxiety, and more fear, and you get stuck in this vicious cycle. And it happens faster. These again are the patients that say to you, I used to be able to handle it, and now I can't. Why is that? And you can say it's because of this pathway. It's the plasticity in your brain that has been laid down because this pathway is getting worn deeper and deeper and deeper. So consider appropriate testing and treatment. Go back through the treatment slides. You know, definitely look at, you know, do Dutch testing, test for nutrients like, of course, B6 and magnesium, and biotin, you know, all these things, um, and iron, um, and, and see what's going on. Consider SNP testing. Um, I don't generally start, per se, with SNP testing because, um, you know, you treat the person, not the SNPs. But it can give you a lot of insight, too, if, if, um, if they... Uh, no, you know, we wanted, we were using a lot of these tests to see how the SNPs are manifesting. Do you have a slow comp? Do you have a slow MAO? And like, let's look, let's look at your VMA. Let's look at your HVA. You know, let's, let's look, look at these things and see how it's manifesting. 
And then number seven, which of course is the most important thing, take care of you first and foremost. Otherwise, um, that anxiety panic cycle continues to spin and spin. And since you all are fabulous functional medicine practitioners, you have to take care of you first. I mean, you just have to, because otherwise you will look like Cruella de Vil in this picture, trying to excel in your career, maintain a social life, have enough water, exercise, text everyone back, stay sane, survive, and be happy. And so put yourself first, take care of yourself. Don't let your amygdala get yourself spinning out of control. Use the slides for treatment and testing on you so that you can in turn help other people be the best that they can too. So here are the rest of the resources. If I forgot to put them on the um, actual slide itself under what I was doing, then I have them here. Otherwise, thank you so much for listening. If you have um, any questions, please feel free to let us know. So one of the questions is, please explain the difference between CBD derived from hemp versus THC. Oh, so hemp, hemp does not, so when you see CBD from hemp, um, hemp does not have the THC in it. Um, so it doesn't have the mind altering effect, which is when it, on the flip side, if you know, looking at cannabis like marijuana has it combined in it. So for those of you who are familiar with, um, you can get various percentages of CBD and THC in a marijuana product. Uh, and of course, there's a million types of marijuana products. You can, you know, swallow it, drink it, smoke it, eat it, vape it, gel it, shatter it. I mean, there's like a million ways. So when you do just a CBD product by itself in hemp, there's, there's, um, I believe, like less, th less than 1%. It's a very, very negligible, doesn't show up on a urine test, um, like a drug test, amount of THC in it. But that's different from cannabis marijuana where you're getting various percentages of D THC and uh, and CBD. But you do need some, um, uh, uh, CBD and THC do work synergistically together, which is why they're doing a lot of study in CBD and THC for various conditions like cancer and you know epilepsy and things like that because of the medicinal effects when they do work together. So I hope that answered that question. Otherwise, Thank you so much for listening, and I hope that you all have a wonderful evening.